like subtle demonstrations of advanced airway techniques. These techniques are described in more detail in the PALS manual and are practiced in the skill station. To effectively manage the pediatric airway, it is important to consider some unique attributes of a child's airway. These illustrations of an adult, child, and infant show that the airways of children and infants are considerably smaller and shorter than those of adults. The adult larynx is cylindrical, with the narrowest opening at the level of the vocal cords. In contrast, the larynx of infants and young children tapers into a funnel shape. The airway continues to narrow below the vocal cords to the cricoid cartilage, which creates a non-distensible ring around the airway. In infants and toddlers, the larynx is positioned more superiorly and anteriorly than in adults. In addition, the tongue and epiglottis are relatively large. Prominent vagal tone may predispose pediatric patients to bradycardia during airway maneuvers. Note that the airway is always anterior to the esophagus, and the cricoid cartilage is the only complete cartilage ring located below the vocal cords at all ages. Also note that under the new AHA guidelines for CPR and ECC, routine use of cricoid pressure is no longer recommended. Keep these anatomic and physiologic considerations in mind as we demonstrate several airway procedures before you practice them in your skill stations. These demonstrations include oral airway insertion, bag mask ventilation, endotracheal intubation, and laryngeal mask airway insertion. If the infant or child is unconscious and has no gag reflex, an oral pharyngeal airway may help maintain a patent airway. To select the correct airway size, place the airway next to the face. An appropriately sized oral airway should extend from the corner of the mouth to the angle of the child's jaw when the airway is positioned next to the face. If the device is too large, it may block the airway. If it is too small, it can cause the tongue to obstruct the airway. This airway is the correct size for this mannequin. One technique of inserting the airway is to use a tongue blade to depress the tongue. The airway may be inserted on its side or in an inverted position and then rotated into place. Remember, the oral airway should not be used in conscious, responsive children as it may cause a gag reflex and vomiting. Effective bag mask ventilation is an essential BLS intervention that will be reviewed in this station. If neck or spinal trauma is suspected, attention to simultaneous cervical spine motion restriction is important. To use a bag mask device, position yourself directly above the child's head. Place the mask on the child's face using the bridge of the nose as a guide. Use the thumb and index finger of one hand to make a C to press around the edges of the mask. The remaining fingers of your hand should form an E to lift the jaw and open the airway. If you tilt or extend a child's head beyond the neutral position, the airway may become blocked. Make sure you hold the mask against the face with your thumb and index finger while using the remaining fingers of that hand to lift the jaw and open the airway. Make sure you make a tight seal between the mask and the child's face. Squeeze the bag with your other hand to deliver just enough breath to make the chest rise. Deliver each breath over one second. If the chest doesn't rise, then you are not providing adequate breaths. Adjust the mask, reposition the head and neck, or administer a larger amount of air. On an infant mannequin in the practice station, the technique looks like this. Position the victim. Apply the EC clamp technique. Open the airway. Squeeze the bag slowly. Observe for chest rise. When a child or infant has a pulse but is not breathing effectively, rescuers should perform rescue breathing, ventilations without compressions. For infants and children, give one breath every three to five seconds. That's about 12 to 20 breaths per minute. Give each breath in one second. 
Each breath should result in a visible chest rise. For all ages except newly born, once an advanced airway, such as an endotracheal tube, is in place, rescuers no longer pause chest compressions to give breaths. One rescuer delivers continuous chest compressions at a rate of at least 100 per minute. The second rescuer gives one breath every 6 to 8 seconds, about 8 to 10 breaths per minute. The rescuer giving ventilation should be careful to avoid excessive ventilation. The technique of endotracheal intubation when performed by properly trained providers allows reliable oxygen delivery to the lungs with less risk for gastric distension. Special care and expertise are necessary to maintain cervical spine motion restriction during intubation if spinal trauma is suspected. Proper endotracheal tube and other equipment sizes and medication doses is often best estimated with a color-coded length-based tape. Measure from the top of the head to the heel. The new AHA guidelines for CPR and ECC recommend the following formulas for calculating endotracheal tube size. For uncuffed endotracheal tube, age in years divided by 4 plus 4. For cuffed tube, age in years divided by 4 plus 3.5. All equipment, such as suction equipment, should be tested and ready for use. Specific equipment assembly will be reviewed in your skill station. In infants, optimal airway alignment can usually be achieved by placing a pad or towel under the shoulders and torso. Optimal airway alignment is usually present when the external auditory meatus, the opening of the ear, is approximately even with the height of the anterior shoulder. This is called the sniffing position. In older children, airway positioning can sometimes be optimized by placing a folded towel or pad underneath the head and extending the neck forward to position the child in the sniffing position. This allows more direct access to the trachea. If spinal trauma is not suspected, position the child in the sniffing position. If you are going to insert an endotracheal tube, either a cuffed or an uncuffed tube is acceptable, but a cuffed tube may prevent aspiration and is preferred under certain conditions, such as poor lung compliance. If a cuffed tube is used, inflate the cuff with the minimum volume of air needed to prevent leakage of breaths around the cuff. Adequate pre-oxygenation should be provided. Pre-oxygenation is the administration of 100% oxygen by mask for at least three minutes with normal tidal volume breaths. During pre-oxygenation, oxygen replaces nitrogen in the lung and lengthens the time before desaturation occurs during intubation. Suction the oral pharynx if necessary. Either straight or curved laryngoscope blades can be used. In this demonstration, a curved blade is used. Holding the handle in your left hand, open the mouth using your right hand. Next, insert the blade into the mouth and follow the natural curvature of the pharynx, sweeping the tongue to your left as you reach the base of the tongue. When the epiglottis is visualized, the tip of the blade may either be placed into the vellecula at the base of the tongue or used to lift the epiglottis directly. Lift the laryngoscope in the direction of the handle to expose the glottis. Do not rock the laryngoscope back and forth. Avoid pressure on the upper lip, upper gum, and teeth. An assistant may improve your view by applying tension to the right corner of the mouth. Insert the tracheal tube from the right corner of the mouth. Do not insert the tube down the central barrel of the laryngoscope blade because this will obstruct your view. Advance the tracheal tube through the glottic opening to the mid-trachea. Many tracheal tubes have a glottic marker that estimates correct depth when placed at the level of the vocal cords. If using a cuffed tube, inflate the cuff. Once the tube is positioned, hold the tube in place and begin positive pressure ventilation. Watch for symmetrical chest rise. Auscultate over the stomach first, then both axilla. Breath sounds should be audible in both axilla and over the lung field, but not over the stomach. If symmetrical breath sounds are not heard in both axilla, consider possible causes such as main stem intubation or pneumothorax. An exhaled carbon dioxide detector can confirm airway tube placement after six breaths. 
It is important to note that a carbon dioxide detector only tells you that the endotracheal tube is in the airway, not that it is in proper position. Exhaled carbon dioxide will also be detected with main stem bronchus intubation. This capnograph tracing confirms that the tube is in the airway, but does not confirm proper position within the trachea. During cardiac arrest, pulmonary blood flow is very low, so exhaled CO2 may not be detectable despite correct endotracheal tube placement. If there is still uncertainty about correct endotracheal tube placement, perform direct laryngoscopy to visualize the tube between the vocal cords. Although useful, the presence of water vapor in the tube, symmetrical chest movement, and audible breath sounds may not be 100% reliable indicators of proper tube position. Once tracheal tube position is confirmed, secure the tube. There are many ways to secure the tracheal tube in an infant or child. Once a child is intubated, verify tube placement at regular intervals and whenever the child is moved or if the child's condition changes. A child with an advanced airway can deteriorate at any time. In these cases, urgent assessment is required. A mnemonic such as DOPE may be useful to troubleshoot causes of acute deterioration of an intubated patient. D stands for tube displacement. Check that the tracheal tube has not migrated into a main bronchus or out of the trachea. O is for obstruction. Make certain the tube is not kinked or blocked by secretions and is patent. P is for pneumothorax. Check for bilateral chest wall movement, breath sounds, and acute change in exhaled carbon dioxide. Unlike in adults, in children, tension pneumothorax may not show obvious tracheal deviation or distended neck veins. E reminds us to check for equipment failure. If the patient is being manually ventilated, ensure that oxygen is flowing to the device. This mnemonic will be used throughout the PALS course to assess intubated infants and children who exhibit a sudden deterioration. Practice using this mnemonic as you progress through your skill stations. The laryngeal mask airway is a supraglottic airway device consisting of a tube with a distal inflatable mask. It is inserted blindly into the hyperpharynx and it sits above the glottis. It can be inserted without interruption of chest compressions. Laryngeal mask airways are available in a variety of sizes. The correct size is based on the patient's weight. Weight ranges appropriate for each airway are printed on the package, on the device, or both. For example, use a size 2 laryngeal mask airway for a child who weighs 10 to 20 kilograms. The maximum amount of air recommended to inflate the cuff is also noted on the package and the device. Before using the airway, read the manufacturer's instructions and ensure that the mask inflates properly. Then, partially or completely deflate the mask based on operator preference. Lubricate the mask with a water-soluble lubricant. Open the mouth and insert the airway. Many of these airways can be inserted with the mask opening facing either the tongue or the roof of the mouth. If the airway has a rigid curve, it must be inserted with the opening of the mask facing the patient's tongue. If the device is inserted with the opening of the mask facing the roof of the mouth, you'll need to rotate the mask opening to face the tongue where the mask reaches the back of the pharynx. Once the device is in the back of the pharynx, use your index finger to press the mask against the roof of the mouth. Continue advancing the device until you feel resistance, indicating that the distal end of the tube has reached the hypopharynx. Withdraw your finger and inflate the mask. Use only the amount of air needed to create a seal, and no more than the volume recommended by the manufacturer. Often, only half the recommended volume is needed. Once inflated, the laryngeal mask airway will center itself in the mouth. After insertion, just as with an endotracheal tube, verify tube placement with clinical examination and an exhaled carbon dioxide detector. If the child has a perfusing rhythm, you should detect exhaled carbon dioxide. Observe for chest rise and listen for breath sounds over both lung fields. 
When ventilating through the laryngeal mask airway, you'll notice some resistance. This represents the resistance to airflow through the airways into the lungs. If you feel no resistance when providing breaths, the chest does not rise or you don't hear adequate breath sounds, the airway may not be in correct position. It may not be sufficiently deep in the hypopharynx or the cuff may have folded during insertion, blocking airflow. For such problems, deflate the mask. Remove the airway. Provide bag mask ventilation. Then attempt insertion again. As you learn and practice these advanced airway techniques, think about how you might apply some of these skills in your everyday practice to support children in distress.